Would you stand as I read from the scriptures this morning? Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. And let me get your minds thinking the direction we're going. Last week, what gates did you enter? What gates? A farm gate? An arena gate? A pool gate? A yard gate? A prison gate? A computer gate? What gates did you go through? Years ago, the Jews were familiar with gates also, and Jesus is going to give us a lesson about the narrow gate and the wide gate. Let's look at his word from Matthew 7 again, like I said, verse, starting in verse 12, and hear what he has to say. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, there are few who find it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Narrow gate and wide gate. Narrow and wide. Yesterday's Daily Bread talks about Jordan Spieth. I'd ask Tony how do he pronounce his last name. Spieth. Um, Jordan Spieth was a professional golfer. Of course, if he was visiting here in Adair County, many of us would go out to watch him. Last April, he was about to win the Masters Tournament. That's a prestigious tournament on the PGA Tour. He was ahead three rounds. And the last day, I think on the last nine holes, he just couldn't do it. Couldn't make the great shots. Just kept losing strokes, maybe even bogeying holes. And in the end, he tied for second place. He lost that first place position. A fellow named Danny Willett won it. And they gave Danny at the awards ceremony, Danny got the green blazer with the master's emblem. And Jordan didn't get it. Now, of the different reactions that Jordan had, if you read the Daily Bread, you know the answer. But what are the different reactions that Jordan Spieth could have given to Danny Willett? He was at the award ceremony. He got second place. He could, have, he could have been sulking, right? Just down on himself. He could have been sarcastic. Well, I could have won it. You know, he shouldn't have won it. Oh, he could be, he could say some words you shouldn't even say. Hopefully the microphone's not turned on. Or he could be sweet, gracious. And the New York Times reported to him, as being very gracious to Danny Willett, congratulating him, complimenting him, celebrating with him his victory. To me, Jordan Spieth took the narrow way. There were lots of selfish ways to respond, but Jordan took the gracious way. That would be our God's way, to be gracious. Narrow gate or the wide gate? In these short two verses, Jesus draws a contrast between three pairs of things. Three pairs. First, very obviously, he talks about two gates, the narrow gate and the wide gate. Narrow and wide. Narrow leads to life. Wide gate leads to destruction. Clear contrast between life and death heaven and hell. Two gates, and he also talks about two groups. He distinguishes between the groups by the number of people who will go through those gates. He says, few find the narrow gate. Many find the wide gate. Years ago, I remember cattle farming with Karen's dad. We had 16-foot gates. If you wanted the whole herd to go through, down the chute, you open the 16-foot gate, and down the lane, the whole bunch goes. However, if we're working cattle, we weren't using a 16-foot gate. We're using a 4-foot gate. And you get one cow in the right spot, and you poke her, and in she goes. You shut the 4-foot gate, and you work the cow. And then the next one, then the next one. The wide gate and the narrow gate, the two groups. Very few in the narrow, 
or the whole crew almost going through the wide gate, the whole herd. Jesus is talking to, to the, the crowd at the Sea of Galilee, talking about the few and the many. If I could picture this for you, having seen the Sea of Galilee, knowing there's a, a grassy field on the north side, I would say to you, pretend you're at the Green River Lake on the big cleared field right up to the lake water and, and sitting down. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people sitting down listening. That's what it looked like. This is the group to whom Jesus is talking. There's a few and there's many. Sitting in that crowd, he, we hope the people are beginning to wonder which gate am I going through? Am I on the, on the right team, the few going to life? Or am I with the crowd going to death? Where am I? And Jesus does this masterfully, just talking about two gates, two groups. Does the Bible support the fact that few people can be saved at times? How many people got on the ark? Eight. Thousands perished, eight lived. Of everybody who came out of Egypt in the nation of Israel, how many entered the promised land? Two. Thousands and thousands of Israelites brought out of Egypt through God's power, and they refused to go in and take Jericho. Only Joshua and Caleb got to see the promised land. Few. However, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 families are saved. You know, 10 or 15,000 people come to Christ in, at one time. That's a crowd. That's a huge harvest. That's God's will. But Jesus is particularly talking about a few find it. Why would he say that when, when now so many have found him? Why would he tell this crowd that few find it? I think he's trying to press them. If you go back to the beginning of Matthew 7, which is the later part of the Sermon on the Mount, he's already been teaching for two chapters. He's already been teaching on when you pray, pray privately, don't make it a show. When you fast, fast privately, don't make it a show. When you give, give privately, don't make it a show. In the beginning of 7, he says, don't condemn lest you be condemned, which don't judge lest you be judged. He's talking to a group of people who are show-offs, and they're picking on each other. Oh, look at you. Look what you didn't do. You didn't follow the right rule. You're in trouble. <gasps> You're condemned. You're not like me. Jesus has to tell this crowd, take the log out of your eye and leave that little speck alone in your brother's eye. Look at yourself. Because they were looking at everybody else, pointing their finger. So Jesus kind of points his finger at them. You know, do to others as you would have them do to you. Narrow is the gate. Few find it. Two groups. And I'm wondering, even today, there are two billion Christians. I'm not positive how many are actually Christians, but they report that they're Christian or have faith in Christ. That's, you can't evaluate that unless you see the fruit. Two billion out of seven billion are Christians. That's 28%. That means 72% of the world is not Christian, is unsaved. We've been at this for 2,000 years, and the world is still not saved to Jesus Christ. Two groups, the few, two billion, and the many, five billion. We're still outnumbered. And that's not good for their sake. Our job here is to save everybody in Adair County, if, if at all possible, to reach them. Third pair is two goals, two destinations, two ends. Jesus clearly says through the narrow gate leads to life, meaning eternal life. And the wide gate to destruction, to hell, to the lake of fire. Jesus, of all the Bible speakers and writers, Jesus is the one who talks the most about hell. Hades, destruction, 
not to send us there, but to save us from there. He came to save, not to condemn. So he tells the crowd, look, all this showing off in the temple, forget that. This condemning each other, forget that. Find the narrow gate. And so you're sitting there on the shoreline listening to Jesus, and you're wondering, where is this narrow gate? Okay, they all understood gates. Every city with walls had gates. The temple had 12 gates, the beautiful gate, the eastern gate, the dung gate, the sheep gate. They all understood gates. Okay, he's going to tell us where the narrow gate is, and we're going to go through it, and we're going to have life. We're going to physically find it, like the fountain of youth. That's not what he's talking about. He didn't tell it that day. The Sermon on the Mount does not tell you where the gate is. But if you look into John's gospel, John does tell us. He does tell us. As a matter of fact, the better question is not where is the gate. The better question is who is the gate? Who? Jesus says in John 10, 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me shall be saved. So the disciples probably remembered the Sermon on the Mount. Ah, we get it. The narrow gate is him. In John 14, 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, Jesus said. Believe also in me. That's the gate. The belief in him. Faith in him. He's the way. He says that to to Thomas in verse 6 of John 14. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the gate. Faith in me leads to life, Jesus would say. I'm the only gate. I'm the narrow gate. Paul confirms this writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One mediator, one way of sacrifice, one way of atonement, one way to be right. We're all in agreement. Jesus is the one. He's the only one. But you know, some people may call us narrow-minded. You're so narrow-minded. You think Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Yep. That is so limiting. Don't you realize there are many ways to God? There are many ways to heaven. I said, no, I didn't realize that. Tell me about that. And some people would go on to say, well, if you live a good life, or if you do this or you do that, other religions have access to heaven. I'd be like, really? I don't agree. There's only one way. Our master said there was a narrow gate. He said there's a wide gate and many people are perishing from it, but there's a narrow gate. He's the only one. And we will differ with the world. That's okay. Stand firm politely on the narrow gate, the Lord Jesus. Because if we don't, others others are going to destruction. Destruction is not a good thing. Destruction is a bad word. In the Greek, it means a perishing or ruin. In English, it's defined as the action or process of causing so much damage to something that it no longer exists or cannot be repaired. Destruction. Once you finish this life apart from Christ and you are condemned, you're destroyed. There's no way to repair your relationship with God. It's all over. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief, Satan, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan has come to destroy our relationship with God, and he did it in the Garden of Eden. It was destroyed, but not permanently. It could still be repaired in this life when the Messiah comes. Satan is always working. Oh, America first doesn't think, uh, doesn't think there's a Satan. America doesn't think there's a hell. They may not even be worried about heaven or hell. They don't think there's a hell. 
It's very deceptive, very wrong. We know clearly there is heaven and there is hell. What are the ways to eternal destruction? If you want to go to hell, here's how you do it. Number one, don't believe in the Lord Jesus. Do the opposite of John 14, 1. Don't believe the word unbelief. Unbelief was the sin of the Jewish leaders. Unbelief was the sin of the Jewish nation after Jesus' resurrection. And due to their unbelief in Him, God judged them and brought punishment in 70 A.D. and destroyed the temple, literally destroyed it. It is still not there. It has not been put back together. You could be like the Samaritans. Your unbelief by worshiping idols from other religions. You could be like an Assyrian, completely pagan, worshiping false gods. Or you could be a selfish, prideful person who rejects God, rejects Jesus. That will take you to hell. God doesn't want that, but that's what some people choose. At the Bull Run Music Festival, there was a man who didn't want to hear a word about Jesus, said, don't tell me that. In Greene County, there's a man who sits in church, probably this morning in church, with his family, atheist, no belief in Jesus Christ. Nice guy, but no belief, doesn't want belief, but he goes for his family. Help them, Lord. Unbelief brings destruction. And the second way of eternal destruction is unrighteousness. This is sobering. I'm going to read you a sobering scripture from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. Paul says to that church, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a, that's a huge group. There is forgiveness for all of those sins. There is deliverance for all of those sins through Jesus Christ. But we've got to ask forgiveness. We've got to ask for His help. This is a ways of eternal destruction. Now, there are ways of earthly destruction, too. You can ruin your life in this life, and Satan works day and night to, to ruin our lives. Greed, it destroys kindness. Deception destroys trust. Violence destroys peace. Theft destroys supply. Adultery destroys marriage. Perversion destroys purity. You can ruin your life here. God can still put things together here if you come to Him, bring people to Him. We on the flip side, when we walk, we have come through the narrow gate. I know I'm preaching to the narrow gate crew. I know that. There may be no more than one or two people in this room that's not Christ, and I think they're all, I think you all are Christians. We've come through the narrow gate. What does this mean for us here? We walk in giving and in truth, gentleness and kindness, faithfulness and marriage, sexual purity. We walk in it in what is right. But these are narrow ways today. Narrow ways. So we want to apply this word narrow. When I was preparing the message, early in the week, the word narrow just came to me. I said, Lord, what's the message about narrow? Well, I know the passage about narrow. Narrow gate and wide gate. Yep, narrow. Knowing that this context in Matthew 7 is about salvation. Agreed? Jesus is the narrow gate, the narrow way to salvation, to eternal life in heaven. However, eternal life begins the minute you accept Jesus. And I do want to praise the Lord and share with you some good news. Karina Phipps, a mom of three children, been coming to Trinity a couple of months, gave her heart to Christ after the early service. Stayed after church right down here, and we prayed with her to accept Christ. She came through the narrow gate. She heard the sermon. She'd been thinking about it. She came to the Lord. He is hers. She is saved. Hallie Burton, who was baptized last week, sat here on the pew, came to communion, her first communion after being a baptized Christian. What now? How can we use this word narrow? And I say, yes, 
because we want to narrow at least four things, our attention. Let me give you four things. And you already, already do this. Narrow your attention to the things that Paul says are worthy of our attention, that which is pure, that which is true, that which is praiseworthy, that which is, is, is good. Focus on those things. Karen and I watched a movie called Gold. I'm not really into gold. I mean, I love to have gold if, if there was gold lying around. But we watched it, so maybe it's got a good point. Maybe the person really comes to realize it's not all about gold. So we, it, had, it had Matthew McConaughey in it, so a good actor. So maybe it's a good movie. We watched the movie, and eh, it's okay. His life's a mess. I won't tell you the whole movie. Then the movie progresses, and things happen, and all of a sudden, all is lost. And then he never learns. His girlfriend learned. She went home. He never learned. I got up from my chair, went to my room. I'm leaving. I'm not watching this movie. It's taking me down, down, down. It, no more attention. It didn't have a good point. So narrow our attention. Thoughts. Narrow our thoughts. Our minds can think of all kinds of things. Right now, if you're thinking about something else besides the Lord, come back. All right? If you're thinking about what we're talking about, that's great. Uh, thoughts can wander. Focus. Paul says to take our thoughts captive. Focus that mind. Then comes thirdly, our words. I have no idea how many words are in the English language. I know the unabridged dictionary is that thick, full of words. There are lots of good words. There are a lot of bad words and a lot of words in between. God would have us to use the best words. So let's narrow our choice of words. Um, Betty, if I could ask you to have a class on the appropriate words to say. Teach us. You know how the appropriate words to say. Uh, the Betty Brown class will be meeting in a couple of weeks on appropriate words and ways to say things. Bring your situation. She will tell you how to respond. Betty, sorry I put you on the spot there, but I just couldn't resist. Graceful words. And lastly, our actions. If we narrow our actions to what is right, what is good and holy, people see that. Not only our actions in, in people face-to-face, -face, but also Facebook, social media, texting. You know as well as I do, we're being watched. So let people see the narrow way. And they may accuse us, you're narrow-minded. Why won't you do that? Why won't you say that? If someone tells a, a really bad story, a really bad joke, do I laugh along with them? No, I just kind of go flat. Sorry, don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I, I don't think that was funny. It makes a difference, especially if they find out I'm a preacher. Then, then in the hospital, they clean up their language. I've been in there sometimes with the doctor, even the nurses. They may have a foul word here or there. They don't know who I am. I don't tell them. I just want to get to know them as they are. Uh, narrow, good, good, narrow gate Christianity. That's not easy. You know that. But let's, let's ask for God's help. It is difficult at times. There are times that someone can make you so mad, you would like to have a string of sentences and words and descriptive adjectives informing them of how useless they are. But please don't. Uh, please find the polite ways to say how they have aggravated you or hurt you. There are good ways to say things. Uh, we, we close the message with this application of the narrow gate. Enter by the narrow gate. Salvation, yes, but also enter each circumstance by the narrow gate, the gate Jesus would have you go through, the gate he leads you through, and then watch the fruit.